I just think optimism is great because I think, you know, positivity is better than negativity and optimism and visualization of positive things works. I mean, like, it's just about like, which direction do you want to go in? You know, which road do you want to go down? I'd rather be happy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to introduce you to our next guest. She's one of the leading figures in entertainment today. She's a talk show host, an activist, a comedian, and a best-selling author. And I'm so excited to introduce you and the podcast, Chelsea Handler. Chelsea, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to have you here. I know we just connected I think literally like 10 days ago. Mm. So you were speaking at this conference called Wisdom 2.0. You were also speaking. And I was there to do a bit of speaking too. And I remember this moment when I was being interviewed on stage and then I saw you in the front row and I was like, oh my God, it's Chelsea. Like I had a moment where I, where I fangirled on stage. I'm not sure if it was obvious at all. And then I was really happy that I bumped into you later on at dinner time. And so when, when we spoke and we connected, I, I felt your energy was awesome. And I'm so glad you came out here. Thank you. That's yeah. very nice. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I went with my sister with my, cause my psychiatrist, which I have to say all the time now, my psychiatrist uh, had re uh, referred me to that or asked me if I had any interest in speaking at the Wisdom 2.0 conference in San Francisco is what we're talking about. And uh, I was like, well, not really, but sure, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and he's like, well, you we could talk about us or you don't have to, you know, I, it's, you know, I can't talk about us. I'm like, well, then let me, because my entire book is about my relationship with my psychiatrist and my kind of, I, for lack of, I hate the word journey because The Bachelor ruined that around 10 years ago, but, <laughs> but like for lack of a better term, my experience with therapy and what it did, you know, I didn't think I needed it and I didn't think I needed to calm down or slow down. And then I did. So it's all about that. So he said, Hey, why don't you come and talk about at wisdom 2.0? And I was like, all right, well, I, I may as well start promoting the book. Since, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's what you do. That's what the book is about. So sure. Let me get out there. Yeah. And I, and I found that really refreshing and the book's called life will be the death of me. It's out April 9th. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who's listening or watching right now, it's probably past April 9th now. So you can go ahead and get the book. It's probably out by now. But that's what I love about the book. And when I saw you there and I saw you when Wisdom 2.0 was sharing that you were going to be there, I was just like, wow, I'm really fascinated by your story and journey, lack of a better word, to mindfulness, to meditation, to personal growth and self-awareness. So we're going to dive into that today. My audience is in love with this theme. And I think they're going to gain so much from hearing about it from your perspective, which I think is going to be really unique for them. So one of the first things I wanted to ask you about was around the quote that you start the book with from Gloria Steinem. And you talk about this quote around how everyone's looking to find the right person rather than trying to be the right person. And I wanted to ask you, why did you start the book with that quote? And why was that so important to you at setting the tone? I, because I think a lot of like, you know, from, from my experience, a lot of my life has been about the end result rather than the being. It's about the doing and like the walking off the stage, not being on the stage. And I think that kind of transfers to people too. A lot of us are looking for someone to complete our lives or somebody to like, you know, be the lid for our pot, so to speak. So for that theme is very important to me because I'm always been very like fiercely independent, almost to the point where it's like, no, when I'm going to reject everyone so nobody gets to reject me you know and and that so i have that kind of opposite like i can do everything i can handle this i don't need help from anyone so i i relate to that theme because it's the opposite of what i feel you know uh, i have it in the opposite direction i just you know it's too powerful too strong too like you know i can fix everything <laughs> and i don't need a man i don't need you i don't need a family i don't need anything so uh I mean, I think those are themes that we all have. It's one or the other for most people, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that when, when I was reading through your book, one thing I found is that it's so open and vulnerable and honest. And one of the things that that reminded me of is this beautiful Banksy painting. I'm not sure if you've seen it. And it says, be with someone who makes you happy. And this little girl has crossed off the width. And then it turns into be yeah. someone who makes you happy. And, and it's, it's a beautiful principle. And I think starting with that, is such a powerful point and it's a powerful message to everyone reading the book because you're so right that we've just never been taught to get to know ourselves. Like one of the things I always talk about is how we've never had a moment to take a meeting with ourselves, even though we have meetings with everyone throughout the day. 
Yeah, I think that's important. I think, you know, you can kind of, you can lose the plot a little bit, you know, we're always into doing and what we're achieving instead of figuring out what kind of person we're behaving like while we're on that road, you know, or to actually take the time and look outside your lane and look at other people's experiences and how they're unlike your own. Like not, not many of us have the luxury to even do that. People are Mm -hmm. just trying to scrape by and, you know, and so if I have the luxury to do it, I better do it. (laughs) I better do that work. If I can afford to go see a psychiatrist for a year, then yeah, I, I'm going to be a better human being at the end of it, which is what I kept telling myself, even though it was painful. And, you know, I didn't want to talk about all these things that I didn't think had a real impact on my life. Mm. I thought it was the past and I'm strong and I'm successful. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, if I'm in pain from a nine-year-old injury of my brother dying, if I'm in pain from, you know, my father's reaction of my brother dying, all of these things that build up and you kind of have like, you know, I know I've had the veneer, like it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with it. It does, it does matter, and it is a deep injury. And until you really repair your own injuries, you're not very useful to other people. So if you want to have a meaningful existence or life, and I want to do things that are impactful and make change, then I need to be get real about it, you know? And so I had to get real with myself, which I thought I'd been being real forever. And then I was like, oh, gross. I have to unpeel this? Like, it was so, it's such a cliche also. Like me, you know, turning it forward and having going my midlife crisis and all of this kind of identity, uh, you know, um, kind of discovery what my identity is and my identity crisis. So it's all been like blah, 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 blah. But I figure, you know what? I've made a career out of oversharing. This is something worthwhile <laughs> because not everybody can afford it. So yeah. we all are recovering from some injury we had, you know, as a child. Um, but, you know, I have, there's a part of me that's very cynical and that's very much a realist. So I have a hard time with a lot of this LA mumbo jumbo and spirituality can, can, can stink of mumbo jumbo a lot of the time. So, you know, it's, you don't, that's why I had a hard time with therapy because I thought it represented that. Like, oh, me navel gazing after I have a show and books about me, I'm going to go talk about myself for two hours. Like what kind of loser am I? So that's, you know, yeah. it was all about ego. Like I can't, it's too much. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm a narcissist. Yeah. And we all have different excuses. Like you're sharing some of the ones you have. And I think we all have excuses, whether it's to see a therapist, a psychiatrist, spirituality, whatever it is. And I want to dive into everything you just said, but I want to go back to what even opened you up to the fact that, like you're saying, you had all these excuses in your head. You had the ego, the narcissism, all of these things that you talk about deeply in the book. What allowed you to go beyond that and say, okay, no, I really need to do this and then stay committed? Because you say when you first started meeting therapists and psychiatrists, you were just sitting there lying to people. And I'm not sure how many people actually go out there and are paying people to lie to them, which seems like a crazy thing to do. But how did you get beyond that last one and then find someone that you could? Well, I interviewed him on my Netflix show, my last show on Mm. Netflix. I interviewed him about brain, adolescent brain development. And I and he was very smart and literal, and he spoke in ways that I could talk about the brain in a non-emotional way. Mm. So I took that as my like, you know, invitation to kind of discuss the brain with him. So when I realized I had to go see somebody, it was after the election, and I just had such outrage, and my anger was out of 10 all the time, and I couldn't work. I couldn't focus on anything but the news and this 24-hour spin cycle that it created. And I just was like, oh my God, I have to harness this anger into something powerful and good, not this. I can't be this way all the time. And they were like robbing me of my life, this administration, and I allowed them to. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing this. So I went, you know, there for that. And what it realized, what I uncovered with through seeing this psychiatrist, because for the first three sessions, all I did was bitch and moan about Donald Trump. Like I was paying somebody, you know, this money to listen to me complain about him. Mm. And I got a lot out of it. I mean, I would have paid him more. But (laughs) after three sessions, like we started to get real and started talking about what Donald Trump's like presidency represents presented to me, which was an unhinged childhood when things were completely out of control. So for the first time in my adult life, things Mm. felt completely out of control. And it like reminded me of my brother going off and saying he was going to be right back and dying. Like that was the other time my life was out of control. So that's why it triggered all this stuff on me. And so talking to somebody and having somebody who has a degree in, you know, psychiatry and, and, and other things, 
telling you, hey, this is, don't minimize an incident just because you weren't raped or sexually assaulted. You have a right to be in pain. You lost your brother. That's painful. You probably haven't matured much beyond that emotionally when it comes to men at nine years, from nine years old. And I was like, no, <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. I'm a nine-year-old when it comes to romance because my brother was like my crush, you know? I mean, he was the oldest. I was the youngest. And once somebody said that to me, I'm like, oh my God, is it that obvious? Like, that's how basic this all is? I answer, yes, it is. And if you don't, you know, ask questions like that or admit it to yourself, then you're just kind of masking pain. So, so I, I loved what you said there because it's almost like giving yourself permission to feel pain. Mm -hmm. Like a lot yeah. of us are masking ourselves from it or we're like, oh, that, that didn't matter. Like, And for you, it was losing your brother, which you talk a lot about how it actually defined you and your family for a period of time before you went through this process where you were able to actually say, I'm not going to let that define me. And Right. I mean, I think that I was being defined by loss. I was being defined by, oh, you know, as a nine-year-old, I didn't have the ability to understand that my brother didn't have a choice. He didn't go kill himself. Or to me, it felt like he left our family to go live with another family because he found somebody he liked better with a cooler little sister or whatever. I was, you know, I didn't understand that it was an accident. So I was mad at him and I was, and I, I continued to be mad at people, you know, for any sort of vibe like that, which mm. is, you know, what leads to not ever trusting men or being in a relationship and why I feel so like strongly about providing for myself so that I don't have to rely on another person. Mm. How did you start revisiting these moments in a constructive way? When I hear you speak, it's like you're able to find the patterns. You're seeing the parallels. Obviously, thanks to your psychiatrist, you're able to see that this event could have sparked this. How does someone relook at their life constructively as opposed to destructively, because it could feel like if you, I think the reason why we shun away from these things is because we're scared of diving back into a past experience and having to make sense of it. Yeah. I think, I mean, if it's really painful, you obviously like need a professional because a lot mm. of people aren't willing to, or capable, I think, or have the vocabulary to access your pain. You know what I mean? At nine, something happened to you that was traumatic when you were a child. You don't have the vocabulary to articulate that pain. So that carries with you to adulthood. And as an adult, you still don't have the vocabulary, 100%. even though you do. So I think that like, you just have to really know that like unwelcome thoughts are great things to explore. You know, everyone talks about that with meditation to like, don't try and shut up a negative thought or a doubtful thought, but actually welcome it and consider it and go, oh, okay, this is here. Give it the airtime it needs so that maybe when it leaves, it's gone for longer yeah. rather than trying to tamp something away. So I think all of those things with regard to like memories when you're growing up, it's just, you have to... You have to believe in science and data and understand that going through these conversations with someone is going to be a helpful event for you most often, unless you have some quack that doesn't give a shit about, you know, helping you. Um, so I think most people are in this business because they want to help other people. So, uh, yeah, I think it's important to think about your the memories you don't love. Don't obsess about them, but give them like the respect that they deserve so mm -hmm. that maybe you can sort them out. Yeah, I, I think around a year ago, I, I completely agree with you. I made a video called How Meditation Made Me a Bad Person. And it was because when I first started to meditate, it made me more aware of all the stuff I needed to deal with. And so all of this negativity was there, all of this other stuff was surfacing from my childhood, from my background. And so the video was all around that principle around like, it's not like you meditate and you feel great straight away. No, it's I totally a, yeah. can relate to what you're saying because like I said this to my doctor, I said, hey, listen, now that I'm meditating like 15 minutes a day, I mean, and this is hard for me. Like I'm not into meditation the way I want to be. I want to get it because I know it's right and it's going to help. And I've already seen small signs of it helping with my patients and, you know, setting an intention for the day and, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I think like when you do you know, I think sometimes when you're addressing the very issues you have, the opposite side of those things becomes louder than normal because yes. you're now more aware of your behavior. So that gets, that din gets a little bit louder and you're like, wait, I'm become, I'm doing all the right things. Why am I having doubtful thoughts? Why am I having negative thoughts? And you're like, because you're more aware and those pass too. Yeah. So absolutely. I can relate to that. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. I thought it was just me, but it was that, feeling. yeah, the, 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 the tradition that I studied as a monk in would describe it as when you try and clean a room, a dusty room, the first thing that happens is the dust comes up in your face. And if it was clouding, it doesn't feel comfortable. It's uncomfortable because you're trying to clean a place that hasn't been cleaned for a long time right. or hasn't even been seen for a long time. Yeah. But I love what you talk about in the book. You talk about us building bubbles. 
And, and I like the way you describe that because I do think, and you, you've mentioned the LA bubble a bit already, but it's like we live inside a bubble. And then we all think we don't, but everyone has their own bubble. And then we're living inside multiple bubbles. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience when you started to recognize, you're like, oh, wow, I'm in a bubble. And then how do I break this bubble? I think, you know, again, with the election, it was like when all of this, like this racist stuff was like coming to a head, you know, for me, I really thought like th that we had gotten somewhere. Like I was naive and it was, a, that just was another example of the bubble I live in, you know, um, is that I, I, like I couldn't believe it. And meanwhile, black people are like, it happens all the time. Like, why are you guys surprised now? Like, why are white people not better allies and advocates to people of color? And that's what I spent my time doing last year, reading books, you know, like James Baldwin and Tane C. Coates and or however you say his name, I always screw it up. But, you know, like really just thinking outside of my own experience, because clearly I'm part of some fucking lucky club mm. because I don't have to, you know, worry about what, what I'm going to do next. Even though I do, I, you know, I can pretty much do whatever I want. And, and you have to realize that's a rarefied experience to have. And I, I just thought I deserved it for a really long time until I really started to be like, okay, you know, scared about what was happening in the world and looking around. And I'm embarrassed that it took that long. I have so much respect and admiration for you for having to do that at that stage, like right now in your life, because I think it's, it's wonderful that I, I, when I hear you speak, it's like I recognize the judgment you have on yourself and just like, you yeah. know, I know how much you want to change. And at the same time, I'm just like, Chelsea, no, thank you. Like, thank you for doing this. Because I think that what it's showing is that it's never too late or too early. It's never like, oh, you're too far gone or you're not. It's not this process of like, oh, I wish I learned this when I was a kid. It's like, no, I'm going to take responsibility now and I'm going to change it now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so refreshing. I think it's going to help so many people. Thank so you. So from my side, I, I'm genuinely just excited to see your journey be a catalyst for so many people to just push out of their own complacency, me included, and, and all of us to look beyond that. Well, that would be great. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> I start a movement. I, I think you can. Um, I believe embracing you. Embracing your grief. I believe. Is that what we're going to call it? I don't know. Can we no, come up I with just, a shorter title? Yeah, Catch yeah. You embracing one, your grief. It doesn't sound like an upper. No. So <laughs> I'll think of something Yeah, else. we need some good marketing title. Yeah, yeah, But no, yeah. I, I mean it. Like, I'm, And I'm not just saying it. Like, when I see you talk about this story, when I see you share this message, I get so excited and activated. Oh, because thank you. Because there's so many people watching you that admire you for so many different talents that you have. And then when you say, actually, all of this, like, this is giving its meaning, right? Like, yeah. this is now giving it meaning. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I suppose so. Yeah. It's hard, you know, like, to think of yourself in that way. So, yeah. you know, you just no, try I'm doing and, it for you. Yeah, thank you. Great. I'm glad <laughs> you did. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this book. Man Search for Meaning, which I had on my, which I had on my bookshelf. So I picked it off for this yeah. session. You talk about this book, Changing Your Life. How did you even come across it? And how did it, uh, how I don't did it know. impact you? You know, I read a lot of really hard books when I was in my 20s because I skipped college. So I was overcompensating <laughs> in a major way because my family is, uh, you know, they all did go to college. So I didn't want to be like the one that didn't go and not have my wits about me. So I read a ton. And that was just one of the books. I mean, that's a book that so many people have read and yeah. people quote from all the time. But it really just, it was an aha moment reading that line out of a book, which is something my dad told me to do at a very young age. Like take one line out of every book, even if you don't like it. And that 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 you take with you in life, that you think about, you know what I mean, and contemplate. And you know, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, please just shut up. Like I would just make up lines, you know, out of Anna Karenina. And I'm like, here, this line right here. But that book was the first book that I saw the line, and it was, you know, stop asking what life expects out of you and start asking. Uh, or no, stop asking what you expect out of life and start asking what life expects out of you. Something along yes, those yes, lines. Yes, 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 that's it, yeah. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, wait, what's life expecting for me? It's like you grow up and you think you want and you're greedy and you want this and you want success and you want money and you want happiness and all of whatever you want. And you're never, I never thought, what is life expecting for yeah. me? I'm just like, they're lucky to have me, is my attitude. <laughs> I'm a blessing to the world. Right. Yeah. And then no, Talk that's about, yeah. No, I love that. And that, that is a beautiful piece of advice from your father. Like I, I think everyone who's listening or watching the podcast right now, make sure you do that because I think so often we feel like, oh, I have to finish a book to understand it. And you know, we we place so much emphasis, like what you said at the beginning of the show, uh, beginning of the episode, you were talking about it's always about results. 
And we're always like, oh, how many books have you read? Or did you get to the end of that book? And actually you could just take one line out of every book yeah. and it could I, be transformative. There, the one book that I've never finished was Salman Rushdie, Midnight's Children, because I couldn't, I didn't understand where the hell <laughs> the man was or the boat, or I didn't know what continent we were on. I was reading that and I'm like, I can't finish. And I had such like OCD about finishing books as a child growing up yeah. um, that I... I always did finish. It was the first book I did not finish with Salman Rushdie. I was like, I can't, I don't know what this is about <laughs> and I cannot finish it. I mean, Kierkegaard was easier to get through. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I've had plenty of books that I've never read front to, uh, back to front, but I found so much value in. Like, yeah. it's not about that. And right. I think- It's about taking, like, I always think now, oh, if something's in front of me, like an article or somebody forwarded me something, like there's something in there for me. So just mm -hmm. read it or watch the video for as long as you can and try and just grab something from it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So sometimes it's like really kind of people are putting stuff in front of you. It feels like, oh, wait, you're supposed to see it, you know? Yeah. And I'm not into that, all of that stuff, but I definitely think that their energy makes a big difference in this world. It does. And I'm really glad you said that because I love how in the book, and I share this with you because I'm born and raised in London. I grew up as a complete rebel until the time I was 18. Most of it still lasted till 22 when I became a monk finally. But I, I started off in a very unspiritual environment, was never fascinated by spirituality or anything of that sort. I studied behavioral science at business school. So the brain and the mind for me is where I come alive and love talking about research and all the rest of it. But I love how you call out the superficial use of the word gratitude, universe, yeah. uh, crystals for the sake of it, not, not offending anyone. But I like the point that you make very strongly that that's not really it. And I, I kind of feel like what service, what disservice do you think that does to this wisdom that you've now opened up yourself? Because I guess you and others may have been pushed back by that kind yeah, of language. Yeah, I definitely you, have been. Yeah. But I mean, that's LA. I think LA is very specific to, you know, it's not like, you know, you people think that, yeah, it is a turnoff in a way. For me, it certainly was. It was a turnoff for like therapy. I just group it all together, you know, therapy, yeah. crystals, colonics, like, no, thanks. I'm yeah, not we into hit any of crystals it. before you came in today. So, you told me that. I mean, <laughs> so like, I just don't, but I'm sure, watch, catch me in two years. I'll be like, you know, shoving crystals up my ass. I'll be like, this is amazing. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I've definitely gone down the road of every trend and fad in LA. I mean, some a lot less than others. You know what I mean? Which ones have you got into? Like, you know, uh, I've tried, I mean, I haven't gone off the deep end in the way that my like, you know, girlfriends have, but like I've, you know, cleansed for five days sure. or, you know, fasted for five days. I've done, you know, diets and all, all sorts of things. I mean, I guess I don't have the stick to itiveness that I, that my friends do with this stuff, but I, yeah, I usually lose interest like two to three days in when it's like something silly or mm. I'm drinking charcoal <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's for whitened teeth. Is that, that what it is? No, What's I'm charcoal? not sure. Oh, what it's oh right. For. Oh, okay, I think okay. it's for a colonoscopy, so I have no oh, idea wow. why I would be drinking it at home. <laughs> um, but there's just a lot of things in it's, you know, like healers, you know, that's a great thing, but it's not as big of a community as people make it out mm, to be. You mm. know what I mean? There are real healers and then there are not real healers. Mm. And there are, you know, all sorts of varying degrees of bullshit in this town. Yeah. So it's it's just important to make sure, you know, like you're not a moron. Mm -hmm. And how have you separated that? Like, how have, how have you gone through it? Because I think that's useful. I like what you're saying right now. I think so many people will agree with that, especially people who've come across the community, the tribe, the space, whatever it may be. What's been your way of just calling out stuff and saying, that's not real, that doesn't work? Well, I don't really call it out. I just, right. it's like, it, whether it works or not for you is up to you. So right. like, if I had a better attitude and a less cynical attitude and I went to a psychic and I wanted to believe all of it, then great. I could live in that hubris for the next five days and maybe it's real or not. But like, I don't want to do that anymore. Mm. Like, that's not a good use of my time. I don't think that I need, you know what I mean? Like, I can, I, there are things that I feel find interest. I don't call it out. I don't want to put people down for what they believe in. I mean, unless mm. they're, you know, ridiculous friends and I can just say it to them, which usually I try to do, but I try to do less of now. <laughs> um, but I think that you just say, no, you're not into it. You know mm. what I mean? Like mm. my friend just opened a Korean spa and I was like, you got to come, you got to come. And I go, buddy, I'm just not into getting my face and my body scrubbed by a bunch of women. Like it's not my thing. I yeah. like massages, yeah. open up as a massage spa and I'll come. Like you just kind of say no and it's not personal. It's just yeah. my preference. Yeah. Now I'm really happy you came on this podcast because you could have just been like to me, no, I'm not coming on podcasts. Yeah, I, I could have. I don't, like, I don't like spiritual podcasts. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. But here I am. But here you are. So I feel better than your friend with the Korean spa. 
Mm -hmm. uh, how did, tell me about some of, you alluded to it then. What are some of the things that have changed habits wise, lifestyle wise? You just said that I try and do it less. Like being less reactive. My thing is I was always telling everybody the truth ad nauseum, like whether they wanted it or not, you know, it didn't have to be like solicited. And I just was like this loud mouth. And I, finally I was just like, fuck, who do I think I am? Like, cool it. Why, why am I inserting myself and having like these strong opinions based on very little knowledge, you know? And so I think after a while, and plus I just got burned out, you know, with everything and working so hard and so fast without taking a look around and missing kind of those integral moments that you want to met, remember and have valuable time with. So the things, sorry, I'm rambling. No, no, no. To no, answer your question, the things that have changed, well, I meditate now. My doctor said commit to three months. And so I've, I've done it. And I'm like now into it. Like and I do it every day. 15 minutes a day. Yeah, 15 minutes a day, which is big for me. It's amazing. Um, I am less reactive. I don't say what's off the top of my, you know, uh, uh, my, I don't. How have you stopped that one? Because I that just, sounds hard. I just, it's so much cooler to just sit back and not say anything when somebody, you know, you don't have to like correct people or tell them what's right. It doesn't matter. Like just chill out. I mean, I take a lot of cannabis also, just so you know, like this is part of my program because it because it cut my drinking in half mostly. Mm. And, and then I realized like the great benefits of that. So then I got all passionate about that and how it makes you more present and more mellow. And like for me, especially, it's great ameliorant. Um, so that's changed a lot. I, you know, I'm just more present. And I also don't, you know, when someone sends me a text or an email that annoys me or I don't like, I don't ever respond now. Mm. Like I used to just be like, you know, sitting there typing angrily on my phone. And it's like, it's not a hot look. So just mm. cool and shit like, you know, cool it and relax. And that's my attitude towards everything now. Yeah. So between the meditation, the cannabis, the therapy, I mean, I'm killing it. I love it. I love it. You're, you're, you're killing life. I love it. No, that's great. It's, it's awesome. We all know that life is made up of habits and what we break it down into. And yeah. you're only going to let go of bad ones when you take on new good ones. So yeah. it's nice to see that. And yes, 15 minutes is huge. And it's like, also, it's great to recognize when you feel like, you know, if I feel like I'm losing my patience, I know myself now. And mm. I'm like, okay, either remove yourself from the situation or get your shit together. Yeah. Like you're not going to snap a per at a person. You're not doing any of that, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's good. It makes you feel like an adult mm. more, which yeah. is I feel like I've never had in my life. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And we still all have our moments where we, we do snap or we don't react the way we want to, et cetera. But it's 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 a marathon, right? Or it's you leave take... your therapist and get down and you know to the parking lot and get into an argument with the guy who's parking your car. Yeah. I mean, that's happened to me where yeah. I've been like, you are such a fucking asshole. <laughs> Meanwhile, two seconds ago, I'm like, you know, <laughs> meditating with my yeah. psychiatrist. I'm and like, he's okay. watching from the window and shaking his head. Yeah, and like... but I said that. I remember telling him, I go, oh my God, you should have seen me. I go, I left there and just got in a fight with this guy in the parking lot. And he's like, well, at least you know you, like, at least you're identifying it yes. now. He goes, you two years ago, you would have done that without thinking twice about it. Like next time, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we undervalue just identifying, right? Yeah, we undervalue that. So. We undervalue that because we want to skip from doing something bad to never doing it again. Yeah. And the point in the middle is identification and recognition and acknowledgement of a mistake we're making. Yeah. And that's like such an important step. Yeah, I agree with that yeah. for sure. I think identification, awareness, and modification is an acronym that my guy Dan taught me, which is, you know, identifying the issue is half the battle. And then, you know, you're aware of it and then just modify it. Mm. Just don't react. Don't do the thing that you do every single time. Do something different. And then before you know it, that's your habit. Yeah. And that's rehabituating yourself to like all the positive things. For sure. Yeah. Identification, modification. No, come on, keep up. No. Identification, awareness. Awareness. I am. Okay. Modification. Oh, I am. Yeah. I like you're that. Not ready I like, I'm not ready. Not I'm ready. not ready. Oh, no. This is good. Look, you're sounding like a uh, psychiatrist now, but you I just know. told me you're not ready. That what, I know, just crushed what a, myself. What a pivot Steve. for my career. I so know. Now I'll be giving grief counseling therapy sessions with absolutely no degree. But on TV. Mm -hmm, right. But on TV to reach more people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it may work. It may not work. A televangelist. I love it. I love it. And and with this book, I mean, writing it must not have been easy, I feel. Uh, it wasn't hard. Oh. It was, oh, okay. I welcomed that kind of like, I like a challenge. You like challenging yourself, right? But yeah, I was definitely in a lot of different parts of the world, crying in airports or on planes, writing it. And even wow. rereading it, it still is like hard. Even when I did the audio recording, it was hard. And so I'm doing this tour and I'm going around uh, the country uh, to different uh cities and I'm doing, instead of doing stand-up, I'm having a 
different celebrity in each part of the uh, the country interview me. Somebody who's like Sean Hayes is doing Chicago, Natasha Leone is doing New York City, and so on and so forth. So yeah, and if you come to that, you get a, a book. Also. Oh, nice! So I it's LiveNation.com. You can buy tickets for that. It starts April 11th in Boston. Oh, I love that. That yeah. sounds fun. How many cities are you doing? Twenty. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, brilliant. That's yeah. gonna be a lot of fun. So yeah, wherever you are. In the U.S., you can head over. Are you doing anything in U.K. as well? No, not no. the U.K. Not no, the UK. Sorry, not yet. Guys. You not have yet. To wait. You have to, you're not ready. No, no. You're not ready. Everyone in London, England, you're yeah, not ready. Yeah, that would be a real wake-up call in London. I know. People can you like, imagine wait, that? The, you think you're cynical. The cynicism in England is huge. Yeah. Like, having grown up in London my whole life, like the, the amount of cynicism around self-growth, personal growth, personal development is huge. Mm-hmm. Like One of the things that I found refreshing when I moved to New York two and a half years ago now. And then when I moved to LA, where so many people would say, oh, I was just with my therapist the other day. I've never heard that in my life living in England. Like that's a big cultural difference. Yeah, for sure. Just in terms I have of a ha- British friend who lives here and she's like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> she's like, oh, everybody's all therapied out here. Yeah. Yeah, meanwhile, cut to, she'll be in therapy. And oh, she's weeks, not yet? Inside of two weeks. She's not yet? Oh no, she is. Oh, she is. Okay, okay, she is. She is. Yeah, it seems to be positive. And it's, it's about finding that right person. That's how I've always felt about it, that it's, it's finding that right person and then it just it's just waiting I guess till you feel you can be honest with someone yeah right until you keep lying but okay so one of the things I want to talk to you about that you bring up a lot in the book is this feeling of what empathy really is and how so often we we think we're showing ourselves crying for other people or feeling for other people but really we're just doing it so that we can be seen that way well some people no I mean I don't speak for everybody but for me I was I was sympathetic, but I lacked empathy. Like I was- Explain the difference for us. Sympathy is like, if you see somebody, a homeless person who needs money, you give it to them. But empathy is actually thinking about about what it is like to be a homeless person asking for money, like putting yourself in that person's shoes. So I'm great at showing up in a crisis and being like, you know, a fixer and doing all of that stuff. But I was never really considering what that person was going through. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to do the Band-Aid and fix them up and patch them up. And I want everything to be back to normal because I, you know, know how to fix a bad situation because of my brother dying. So like Mm. that led to me to kind of never think of empathy. Like I had to ask what the distinction was as well. And um, so it's, it's eye opening. And once you identify again, that you don't have something or you're, that's not your like, you know, muscle that you've been using and you look out for it, then you're already in, you know what I mean? You're already so much better off. You just have somebody tell you, I was so excited when he told me like these things that I was missing. I'm like, okay, great. Where do I get it? (laughs) Yeah. Like, do I buy it or like, what, you know, and, or do I, you know, build it? And so that is great. What's great. The powerful, like, you know, the power of the human mind and how Mm. you can create stuff that you have a deficit in, so to speak. Yeah. I love how the book oscillates between playful and profound. And I was wondering how your, the comedian in you has transformed through this journey. Like, because I guess that's been such a strong part of your identity for so long. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Of? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I. The book's very funny. Yeah. No, yeah. it has to be for my yeah, readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want them to read something and expect something from me that doesn't deliver on that front. I yeah. mean, it's going to be much deeper than people had uh, probably expected. I think so. but, that too. Play for profound. But it's, yeah, I think it's a, for me, I can't digest anything too serious. I need funny, like a little bit, you know yeah. what I mean? And there's already been too much seriousness with this, with the election and politics. It's too much. Like mm. I needed to get away from all of that and mm. focus on something that I'm going to do with my life and other people that, you know what I mean? Like I want to really do something and make yeah. a difference in a way. So it's about that. And yeah. yeah, it is a challenge that we fill our lives speaking about, thinking about, and gossiping or talking about something that we don't like. It yeah. is funny how that just evolves right. so quickly. We like the negative. Yeah, yeah. And we just find that every one of our conversations, every one of our meetings ends up being about what we don't like. And hence, we're not building or putting energy into anything practical. Like you're saying, you need to, to get away from it. I mean, that's one of the things. So a lot of people say to me, like with the videos I make online, like, why do you think that's working or whatever in the last couple of years that I started making content? And a lot of the feedback I think is because people want to move away from everything else that they see on social and everything that they see on the news. Yeah, and They're yeah. looking for alternatives. Right. Yeah, yeah. People want right. alternatives. I yeah. mean, there was just a stat that came out about Alexandria Ocasio-Ortez getting more Twitter and all of her bench tweets are positive and they did some, you know, and saying that she's getting as much more attention than Donald Trump for all the positivity she's creating versus his negativity, which yeah. is good. Great. Let's go with that. 
Yeah, yeah, let's go with that. Absolutely. Right. That was the article I was sharing as well, that Inc. did that piece on the 777 yeah. million Facebook posts of 2018. And the most popular ones were all positive. They were right. all uplifting. Yeah. The top 500 were not full of the negativity. So it shows that there is a shift in humanity. Like mm -hmm. we are changing as a whole, not just you, but your change is very- Well, it's, I don't think it's we're changing. I think people are inherently good or inherently yes, bad. And agreed. I think there's more good than there is bad. I mean, I'd like to think that. But I also think that it's just more exposed now because we have the capacity to make these videos that you make, you know, so well. Like people have, the, they can spread the love and the share the love and they can spread the hate and they can share that too. So it's just a matter of which one has more people. So like, <laughs> let's get everybody on the right side let's of it. Let's shift. So this book's going to do it. No, oh, yeah. make more videos. Yeah, this should yeah. change everything. This should change everything. This book is going to define, no. But- but it is, it is hopeful. It is hopeful. Like, I, I, I don't know how you see it now. Like, having gone through the process, I mean, God, where are you at with how things are now and how's your viewpoint changed? Well, I think things are moving in the past w with regard to... With regard to the state of politics. Oh, the, the I just think optimism is great because I think, you know, positivity is better than negativity and optimism and visualization of positive things works. I mean, like... It's just about like, which direction do you want to go in? You know, which road do you want to go down? I'd rather be happy, you know, than, yeah. than pissed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think for me, it's that feeling of being activated and energized to be a part of that change, to try and push forward, do something different, which I see, you know, and I know we're joking two seconds ago about this book, Changing the World, but it's, it's still someone like yourself taking a stance to say, I'm choosing this side, mm -hmm. I'm going this way. And right. I think that's important. I think the more people that choose to do that with their platforms and everything will, will help people yeah. move that way because it's you verbalizing your choice right. to everyone, which you could have just made to yourself. What made you want to do it for everyone else? Like what made you want to articulate this to other people? I think my just experience with my therapist, I thought, you know, I was taking time the year off and all I was doing was like campaigning for people or throwing fundraisers at my house to try and, you know, flip the house in 2018. So... During that time, I was like, all right, I'll go to therapy while I'm doing it. And then after like a couple of months, I started writing stuff down. I'm like, wait a second. This could help people that can't afford to do this. This yeah. could help people who have that childhood pain that they can't unlock and they don't know why they're failing at things in their life as a result of it um, or why, how it's in fact, you know, in, impeding themselves, you know, their growth. So then I started writing it and I was like, oh, this is really personal. Like no one's going to want to read this. It's too personal. It's like, you know, it's a bummer. It's like, you know, some, there's a lot of death in the book. And, and then I, my editor just kept pushing me. She's like, I think you need to just write what's happening with you right now. Like write it all. Like, I don't care if it's, I'm like, this is going to be a death book. Like this is, no one wants this. And she just kind of pushed me to do it. And then through it, I was like, this is exactly what I should be writing about. Mm. Oh my God. And then I was like, oh wow, this is going to be some, something people can look to who don't, you know, who have the same feelings. Since I wrote it and since I recorded the audiobook, I've heard like two other people just in passing, people I didn't know, with the same identical stories as me. So I can't even imagine how many people are out there. 100%. And I think that's so true that when we put out a story, it attracts that community together yeah. who have that same story and experience, which we think often that we're the only one who are having that experience, but it is shared. It yeah. is a shared experience. Yeah, it's shared. And that's where the strength comes in. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. such an energy attraction because people are so into, you know, commiserating with other people and finding out that they're not alone. Like yeah. no one is alone. What you've experienced, someone else has experienced. Such a powerful point. Yeah, so true. Never feel alone. Yeah, every, there are so many people going through the same thing. And I mean, the book does focus on, have a lot of death in it, but also you, you dedicate two chapters to your dogs. Oh yeah, uh, and I thought three. that three. I have three dog chapters. Three dog chapters. Yes. Okay, three it's chapters. Two. The dog. brother and sister only deserve one chapter plus okay. their assholes, so they don't get their own chapters. <laughs> but the other two, yes, God yeah. rest their souls, <laughs> they deserved it. Chunt for sure deserves his own chapter. Yeah, T tell us about how much joy they've brought into your lives. How long have they been around? Oh, I have these two idiot dogs now. They're like <laughs> a br br brother and sister named Bernice and Bertrand. I did not name them, so obviously I went to. I like chow chow mixes, so I went to a shelter. North North of uh, LA, like two hours north, and she had a bunch of chow mixes. And then she's like, "But I have a brother and sister named Bert and Bernice." And I was like, "I don't even need to see them. Like, that's <laughs> those are my dogs. Bring them to me." And then she's like, "Oh, we have to do a home inspection." 
And I thought, what? Oh my God. I, you don't really, but I, I thought, you know, I would let you go through my taxes with a forensic accountant if it meant I could have these two dogs named Bert and Bernice living at my house. They're like little lions. And I can't wait to see them. Yeah, he's a big <laughs> fat baby and she's a big fat, she's a big fat bitch. So I'm happy. Yeah. They're very challenging. They love my cleaning lady. They don't want to be alone with me. Oh, wow. Unless I'm in a car and then they'll go anywhere with me. So that's how I have to lure them. It's been a real bait and switch operation at my house. Oh, amazing. And my brother or my nephew moved in and he's got an Australian shepherd. So we have three dogs now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Do you think that they're, they're, they're any, do you, do you have any thoughts on like dogs positivity? Yeah. And, well, they're positive yeah. for sure. Yeah. Good friends. and. Yeah. I mean, I like people that like dogs. Right. Nice. Nice. I, I like little dogs. Mm -hmm. I, it took me a while because growing up in an Indian household, the closest thing you have to a pet is a fish, which yeah. I don't think really counts. And then when I moved to the US and I had so many friends who had dogs, I was like, oh, okay, now I'm going to figure out which types of dogs I like. I like small dogs. Yeah. That's kind of where well, I'm that's good to, that you yeah. know that. Yeah, I know that. I'm self-aware. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm identifying. Yeah. <laughs> Awareness and then modification. <laughs> I'm going to remember that now. I am. I really like that. So now that I met you at Wisdom 2.0, which I, I believe is a wonderful conference, it was, it was such a pleasure to meet there and speak there. I'm, I'm excited to see you be in those places, but also in the places that you are, where, where you do have your presence already sharing this message. I'm so excited for the book to be out. We're recording this a bit before the book's out, but I'm so excited for the book to be out. I'm so excited to see how it helps and affects and supports so many people. And I'll be cheering on meditating from the sidelines for its success. Oh, thank you. And for it to meet a lot of people. But is there anything, Chelsea, I always ask this, is there anything I haven't let you share or you feel like I missed or you're like, Jerry, you didn't let me share this. I really no, need to share. No, I feel like I've shared. Okay. I feel like we're good, right? Amazing. Awesome. Yeah, no, so do I. I think you shared beautifully. Thank you so okay. much for being open, vulnerable, and sharing so beautifully on the podcast. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.